Let's begin by turning to a few scriptures in the New Testament. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. And then let's turn to Revelation chapter 19. And verse 7. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And then in chapter 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Our Lord, we come to you this morning. We're thirsty to know more of thee. We come this morning, Lord, to hear and to be able to respond from our hearts, come Lord Jesus. And we come even into this larger dimension, that which is your church, destined to be your bride. And we want to learn how to find ourselves in single voice with the Holy Spirit, who is interceding for us deeply within and saying, come. Lord, bring us to this place of preparedness. We know not exactly ex what needs to be done by way of righteousness, deeds. Perhaps it's only a turn of attitude. And then you will come. Do instruct us and give us understand your way and your will in these last days. We pray you have mercy and grace upon us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. We know we are near the end of time, end of history as we know it. There's very much going on in our present world that shows that there's a tremendous shaking of kingdoms going on all about us. And we see, as, as we've studied in the book of Revelation, that this shaking is not something that is just happening because of the sinfulness of the nations, as much as that's true. But the shakings are actually a result of one who can't be seen, but who nevertheless is in heaven holding a scroll and loosing seals. And with every loosing, there is something shaken here upon this earth. There is a process of destiny which will bring this earth into a millennial reign and then, through tremendous fire and heat, be transformed into eternity. And this course is unstoppable. And we are part of a great mystery. Because the Lord is preparing his church. We read in Ephesians 5. The Lord is preparing his church in order to present the church to himself in all her glory. Our Lord is presenting to himself. So in one sense, our Lord is sitting on his throne in the heavens, 
And yet, in a mysterious sense, he's down here, very hands-on, washing, smoothing, working out the wrinkles, of course, by this precious Holy Spirit. The Spirit has been assigned by the King to get the bride ready. And we know our Lord says, what he begins, he finishes. The Alpha is the Omega. And so in one sense, we gain great assurance from this fact. The Lord will finish and prepare a glorious bride. We see there up in heaven how they're rejoicing because finally the wedding has come and there is a bride for this groom. What a heart he's had all along. We remember in John chapter 17, his prayer actually had a lot to do. Oh Lord, would you make them one? And sanctify them by thy word, so that I might share my glory with them and they with me. And all could see my presence in them. I in them, thou in me. The Lord has so much on his heart, we see these things. Yet isn't it interesting that there's a place for us and some work for us to do? The very statement, the bride has made herself ready, implies that we have cooperated in this sanctifying process. So it isn't for us to sort of lay back and say, okay, Lord, do your work. But it's for us to be exercised in our will, as our brother so wonderfully shared last night. And exercised not only in these matters of personal sanctification but in a transformation of character so that when the bride says, along with the Holy Spirit, come, uh, the bride won't look ugly. She'll have the character of Christ. And the mystery must further be stated that somehow... Since the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was set upon this earth to do this finishing work, in some sense, the bride and the Spirit have been saying, come, for a long time now. There's many saints who have been sanctified and prepared by God, now gone into glory, in the presence of the Lord. How wonderful. But we see in this verse, or we understand that there must be a representation of this bride of sufficient character and maturity upon this earth that it can join with the Spirit and say, come. Listen, our Lord Jesus Christ wants to come to this earth. So uh, the saints in heaven, they're not praying, come. That is, come to heaven. Well, they're already in His presence. But, of course, on the other hand, we realize that those in heaven clearly see that our Lord's design is for a kingdom on earth. But nevertheless, somebody on earth needs to say, Lord, come here. It, it means come here. The Lord wants this united voice, the Holy Spirit, who has been whispering this and shouting it, since he came down at Pentecost. But somehow in this mystery, there must be found those people so united in that spirit, so full of that spirit, that this is their major cry. And that's why we look around us and we say, well, now is the church ready? Do we hear those cries? And we have to respond, you know, there are places on earth where there are people who are ready. And there are people to whom this is their lone cry. I've noticed as I've traveled around and ministered various places that where I hear this cry, come Lord Jesus, from the church, the loudest, are places where, frankly, the saints have little other hope. They don't have much prospect for the future. They don't have much income. They don't have a, a free society. They can't get ahead. They can't chase all the things Americans chase. 
some of them under intense persecution, even hatred by their countries for what they believe. And they've only got one prospect, some of them in jail, because they had a Bible and they got caught. And they've got a cry. And what's that cry? Oh, Jesus, come. That's our only hope of glory. We're not going to get it by uh, uh, changing the administration of the United States government. Our only hope is that you'll come. So perhaps we ought to pray that all of us would fall into a, the darkness of an evil nation. That Babylon would be our citizenship. And we could be under such intense persecution that that's all we have left to do. We've got, we got some part of a Bible that we've torn out and hidden in our pants. We read it. We cry, the Lord come. We have nothing else to look forward to. But unfortunately, the Lord wants to do something that gives even greater glory to Him. He wants to find a people who are so blessed and have received so much and that stuff doesn't even affect them anymore. Because they have found the pearl of greatest worth. <laughs> they know who their real treasure is. And whether they've got a million dollars or ten thousand dollars in the bank, they know who their treasure is. And they're crying, come Lord Jesus. This world really needs the Lord Jesus to come back. There's just something missing, no matter how happy your life is. If you will spiritually realize it. So now here we are in the process. The Lord is gathering some people. And he's gathered us as part of that cleansing and preparing work of our Lord Jesus, who's preparing his bride. That's even why we've been gathered together this week. Think about it. And he wants to wash us with the water of the word. And so strike our hearts that we would cry out with a renewed uh, anointing of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord Jesus, come. But it's at this very point, and now I need to talk because I'm talking about the bride, and I need to talk about the church on a wide basis I know that there are some of you here who uh, are almost perfect and ready to be raptured. <laughs> there are some here who are just getting started, and maybe by the grace of God, this MP3 will get out somewhere for the church to hear, and so we need to talk to the church as a whole. Because when we look at the church, those by that I mean blood-bought children of God who have been saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we see a strange mystery that is commented upon in the Bible very clearly, its problem and its remedy. So if I could put it simply this morning, I want to indict the church for its sleep and command it to repent. The church is asleep. And the Lord says, wake up. It's interesting when you look in the scriptures, how much of our own understanding and how much of, the, of our prophetic warning comes to us as Christians from the state of Israel in its various stages. Just as an example, let's look at this mystery of sleepiness. Isaiah, our gospel prophet, received his call in Isaiah chapter 6. Let's just turn there for a moment. <clears throat> After Isaiah falls before the Lord, which we'll talk about a little bit, it comes to his commissioning, where he hears, uh, who, Whom shall I send and who shall go with me? And Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. Now, listen to this commission. Verse 9, this is what the Lord Jehovah, the enthroned Lord over him, over Isaiah, says to him. He said, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. I, this is a description of being asleep. All right? 
Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people fat, is what it really says, their ears heavy. Oh, my ears are so heavy from hearing. <laughs> their eyes dim. It means smear it over, literally. Uh, that otherwise they might see with their eyes. They might hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. That return, by the way, is shuv, turn, repent, and be healed. But Israel has come to this strange position of sleep. Now, this sleep involves a spiritual blindness. But it's not that kind of total blindness, which if you knew you were totally blind, you would immediately seek remedy. But no, this is the kind of smearing cataracts. You've known somebody who's had a cataract operation, I'm sure. And I always say, well, how did it go? And they say, I can't believe I see colors. I see people. I used to see people walking as trees. I, I didn't know how blind I was until these cataracts were lifted from my eyes. But... Israel had cataracts. They saw the Lord, but they didn't see the Lord. They, they, they read the word, but did they hear the word? You remember as I spoke last time. They read, but did they hear? Maybe they heard, but did they heed? And if we in our spiritual response don't go through that full cycle of reading, hearing, and responding, keeping, treasuring, doing, there is a deafness that comes in. Forgive me for making a specific reference, but one time, I remember the first time I was sent, you know, I used to work with young people before I was old, gray-bearded and all. And one time, a Pentecostal church asked me to come, and they had 150 kids in Brooklyn, and they sent them out into the country somewhere, and they asked me to go speak to them. Well, I got up to speak to them, they were so obnoxious, so unruly. They were carrying on, uh, despite all of their leaders trying to quiet them down. I spoke for 10 minutes, and I closed my Bible and went back to the cabin. And the leaders came, what are you doing, what are you doing? I said, I'm not speaking to them. And then they began to say, you know, the problem is they hear about uh, repentance, and they hear about discipleship, and they hear about committing their lives, and they're gospel-hardened. That's what the leader said. They've heard it so much, their ears have just gotten hard to it. They say, oh, oh yeah, we're going to get a thing on the consecration today. Oh, yeah. See, our ears get heavy. Now, listen, there was nobody better than about reading the word. They're, they were better than you and I are, the Jews. In the days of Isaiah, they were reading the word and having it read to them. They read and read and read and read. They had their daily devotionals. And as our brother Lance says, they got a new daily devotional every day. And boom. <laughs> but there was something missing between getting it out of the box into the heart. Because the heart was asleep. And when they heard a word, they said, oh, yeah, that's a word. Wait, i got to take notes on that or else I'll forget it. And they take notes on it, and then they put the notebook away, and they forget about it. This is a strange disease, this spiritual blindness, this spiritual deafness. Because the thing about it is you don't know you're deaf because you're hearing. One time I, I foolishly plunged into the deep in some paradisical spot in Hawaii and came up with my ears full of water. And suddenly my wife was... <laughs> I, I heard my wife. <laughs> and that's the first time I can actually claim spousal deafness. <laughs> I could not understand. My ears were full of water. I'd gone down the wrong way and gotten something up in there. It took days to get it out, and I was always, you know. <laughs> well, this, this was the situation of Israel. Well, well of course, you say, Pff. well, you see, that's Old Testament people. I mean, for goodness sake, you and I are Christians. We don't forget the word of God. We, we don't see and not see and hear and not hear. It's interesting that Jesus quoted this exact passage. 
when he was explaining why he has to use parables. Jesus was saying, you know why I'm using parables? Because if I start speaking about the kingdom of God, they go, <laughs> the ears close up, the eyes smear over. And so I got to catch them off by giving them a parable. They say, what, what, what? Seed in the ground? What? Treasure in the field? What, what? <laughs> and by throwing them off, try to get them to see these precious things that are, are like, that we just are so familiar with. They've bred contempt. Ah, uh, well, you know, Despite the fact that Jesus, while he was here on earth, gave many warnings about how we need to stay awake and watch and pray, we can see in the Bible, in the New Testament, that the church has the same problem. I mean, it gets so bad that even in 2 Peter chapter 3, it were, they, were, they were believers who were scoffing at the second coming of the Lord. Believers. Now, there's many Christian groups that don't even believe in the second coming of the Lord. What they really say is the second coming of the Lord came with Pentecost, but Jesus is not coming back to earth. You know, there's many Christians who believe that. So they never get flustered and, and they never attend such a conference as this. Or they do one session and then don't, don't do any more because they don't believe it. But you believe in the four-square gospel, right? A.B. <laughs> Simpson, he, I think he came up with that term, actually, before the Pentecostals grabbed it. He said, we got to preach Jesus as Savior, Jesus as Sanctifier, Jesus as Healer, and Jesus is coming again. And many people say, what? Coming again? Because he was a Presbyterian, A.B. Simpson. They don't talk about that stuff. Well, A.B. Simpson did. And he, he started the New York City rocking and rolling in the early 20th century because he preached the fourfold gospel. Jesus is coming again. But scoffers, even in the church, say, what is this about his coming? For ever since the beginning of they were saying he's coming, everything's still the same. Why, this isn't a progression of history to be climaxed when Jesus comes again. This is the cyclical Eastern history where everything is om and yom and om and ying and yang. and rrr. Everybody here who's smart knows everything that ever happens is going to happen again. Why, Ecclesiastes told us so. And yes, he told us that when he was spiritually blind. All he saw were things under the sun. And everything just works around and around. And so we've got Christian scoffers. When you talk about the second coming, they say, well, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Well, now let's look at this thing. Because here, here, here is the key. Our only remedy for sleepiness is by repentance. And the only way we'll come to repentance is if the voice of God can speak to us and awaken us. Have you ever tried to awaken a sleeping Christian? They usually just roll over on your shoulder and start snoring louder. <laughs> it's only the voice of God that can awaken the church to its true state. You know, these two things that are spoken about in the book of Revelation are so foundational to the church's understanding. I just would like to take a moment to just say something that Lance already said. John was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. That we read later, our brother Stephen mentioned, that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now let me try to connect these two things. Our faith is built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. And our understanding of the objective reality of our faith is based upon the word of God. We don't have any hope of being awake unless our foundation is upon the Word of God. But the unique thing that happened on the day of Pentecost is that the church was also given a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Because our spirits were quickened, 
we not only had the word of God, which, let's say, which the Jews certainly had, but now, unlike it was in the old dispensation, where a prophet here and perhaps a prophetess there would receive prophetic understanding as well as the word of God. That is, they could spiritually interpret what God was saying. That was the Old Testament. Now, on the day of Pentecost, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your maidservants. Old people will dream dreams with a spiritual interpretation. So I, I, I don't want to spend too long on something you know so well, but listen. You and I were born of the Spirit, and that means that we were born with a capacity through our spirit to see things unseen and to understand and to discern things, even things that are going on. Jesus spoke and said to the Jews of his day, you're able to see the signs in the sky and understand the weather, but you have no spiritual interpretation. But then he said to his disciples in Matthew 24, it, it's worth us looking there, as he talks about that tree and its spiritual importance. Matthew 24, verse 32. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. It's when its branch has already become tender, it's and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, now here is spiritual discernment. When you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the doors. So now, just as an example, when you see the fig tree ripen, I think almost everybody here understands that in 1948, suddenly that fig tree sprung to life. Now, the church... The disciples of Jesus should have the spiritual discernment to hear and sense. That means the Messiah is right here in the doors. He's right here, coming through this door, through this door. He's almost here. Is that what you sense? <laughs> Has it altered your whole life? <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? So the church can only be prepared if it not only has the word of God as its foundation, but a spirit of revelation through whom they can see Christ and what he is doing. I miss the, uh, you know, I, I go to a fellowship in, uh, in Flushing, Queens in New York. And our dear brother Christian Chen, uh, understand he ministered a message just last Sunday that was tremendous. And it was all about the, the spiritual uh, indications that are being seen in the Middle East, especially with regard to Iraq and the fulfillment of this fig tree process. Understand, tremendous message. I, I didn't get to hear it yet. But do we have this kind of spiritual capacity? How can we hold the testimony of Jesus if we don't understand spiritually what's going on? How can we be ready if we don't understand the spiritual state of things? But it's interesting when we look in the, in the New Testament, this, is not, this spiritual sleep is not some strange unknown doctrine. Let me just take you through a few references here so that we can settle this in our heart. This is a major problem. 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5, we see Paul talking. This is perhaps his earliest letter he wrote. And he's speaking to these Thessalonians who, with whom he had only been able to stay for two or three weeks before he was chased away. And yet in that two or three weeks, he'd established them in the gospel, filled them with the Holy Spirit, and told them the details of the second coming. I mean, it's really incredible. But it's because when they got saved, they met together and had a, let's have a meeting this morning. Good. Okay. Uh, what are we going to do now? Well, let's have lunch and let's have a meeting this afternoon. Okay, great. And what do we do now? Let's have a bit of dinner and let's have a meeting tonight. When Paul was in town, it was three meetings a day. Now, only Indians can do that anymore. <laughs> it's too much for human beings. 
But to get together with such a hunger for the Lord, they were together with Paul only a few weeks and already knew about the second coming and the Antichrist and all. Isn't that amazing? Wonderful. Well, anyway, listen to this. Now, Paul tells this young church. Now, as to the times and epics, brethren, you have no need of anyone, anything to be written to you. <laughs> you already know these things. You're spiritually sensitive. You yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Uh, we just heard this in our high-level seminar with our brother Stephen Kahn. These Christians heard this three, four weeks in to their salvation. And while they are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they'll not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. You're all sons of the light, sons of the day. We're not of the night nor of the darkness. So then let us, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and be sober. The time is near. That's the young Christians there. Well, then Paul later on wrote to the Romans, whom he'd never met at the point where he wrote Romans. But let's look what he says in Romans chapter 13. Now, you know, when you're writing to somebody you've never met, you, you don't want to say anything, you know, that's going to turn them off too much. But no, Paul shares the whole counsel of God in Romans. And uh, we get to the end of chapter 13, verse 11, and we just see this exhortation, straightforward. As if this were commonly understood by all Christians, there's a problem with the church falling asleep. So here we go. Do this knowing the time. That it's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night's almost gone, the day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness, put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Well, now, let's take at least one lesson out of that passage. Our flesh make, is what makes us go to sleep. The disciples ashamedly said to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our flesh is heavy stuff. You know, when somebody lives in the flesh, they got a lot of baggage. Uh, I have some dear friends here from Russia, a family of four. They came over here with one suitcase. They now have four. <laughs> and they're heavy. And just my advice for young people here, don't carry Lance's suitcases. <laughs> if, if you're not working out at the gym, it's an impossible deal. Even with four roller wheels on it, it's still, you need some kind of a hand truck. The things of our flesh, that's what causes us to be heavy. You know, when you live out of your soul life, eh, you come. Even some people who serve the Lord out of their soul life, you know what happens? They're totally exhausted. And they fall asleep. If Christians don't learn how to live out of the resurrection life of Christ, if they haven't died so that Christ can live in them, many Christians just completely, the first thing you say to them, how you doing? Oh, I'm exhausted. Well, you've got too much flesh. You're accumulating too much stuff. You've got too many attitudes, too many likes, dislikes, too many this, too many of that. The complexity of carnality exhausts you in your Christian life, and many Christians fall asleep just right out of that. There are some this morning taking a good, good snooze. <laughs> Hopefully it's not because this is carnal preaching. Make no provision for the flesh. Now that's in connection with this matter of waking up. Wake up. If there's something making you tired and exhausted, check it out. It may not be something the Lord's commanded, but something that you're doing for your own self-fulfillment. And it's making you nice and sleepy. Well, let's look at another passage. Maybe some say his favorite church in Ephesus, even in chapter 5 where we'd read before. Let's turn there. 
that in this practical section in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul talks to this church that not only was built upon the word of God and the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, but they were built with a spiritual sensitivity. Their church was born in the midst of spiritual conflict. They were born in the midst of magicians and books of astrology and things that had to be burned for the Christians to go forward in the Lord. They were born in the midst of exorcists. They were born under the uh, principality of Artemis. Not just a, 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 a god of the Persians, but a principality that had its spiritual impact of oppression over that whole area of Asia Minor. And the church was born despite all spiritual opposition because these people had spiritual insight. They had a spirit of prophecy. They understood the times and they understood things of the spirit. And it's to this very church that he says very practically there in chapter 5. Well, let's read the specific verses. I'll trust you know the background. Uh, in Ephesians 5 and uh, verse 14. For this reason, it says, Awake, sleeper! Arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. So I hope you see, if nothing else, he's talking to Christians when he's telling them to wake up. I know a lot of preachers like to use this in gospel preaching. But you're actually calling people to arise from the dead when you're preaching the gospel. Unfortunately, with Christians, they came to life and now have fallen asleep. And what is Paul talking about in that chapter 5, just preceding these verses? He's talking about the darkness of this world we live in. But we're not to walk as children of darkness, but as children of life, light. And to live as children of the light. And even reprove the, the deeds of darkness. And so he says, now if you understand these times, wake up! We're living in a dark world. And you know what darkness makes us want to do? You guessed it. Fall asleep. So easy to sleep in the far corner of the auditorium. <laughs> Just put on some sunglasses. <laughs> the next thing you know, it seems like it's late at night. Oh, how easy to fall asleep. But do you put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh? Do, do you see that there has to be some counteraction? Or sleepiness is guaranteed. For Christians, well-intended Christians, unless we are doing those things that make for us walking in the light and in the day, we fall asleep. And when we fall asleep, then the enemy has won a partial victory because you're one of God's children and you're useless. Useless. I mean, I, I'm speaking in the spiritual kindergarten here for me to say, here's the enemy's strategy. We should not be ignorant of these schemes. The enemy wants to fill your suitcases with so many things you no longer have time to serve the Lord. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. But he said it in this context. The devils come to steal, kill, and destroy you. Here, take this. Here, take that. Put that. Put this in your suitcase. Add this to your baggage. We got, you know, yesterday, my wife and I did this walk around the upstairs gym thing. You know, you can see how much better I look today. And anyway, we couldn't help but hear the, ooh, ah, ee, ah, well, because the U.S. Uh, football game was, they had a television there in the place. So I went over there to look, look and watch, and of course I had to stand up, because all of these little uh, Chinese 10-year-old kids were taking all the seats. <laughs> but the, uh, so, you know, so much for respect, you know. <laughs> but I, as I looked closely, I noticed something. There were four boys sitting on the main sofa right in front of this TV. The soccer game's going on. 
All four of them got some devices. <laughs> they're looking at the devices. They got earplugs in. They, they're not, the game's there. Maybe they're seeing the blow-by-blow -blow description of the game here. No, no, there's the game. No, no. I'm... The other kids, they, they got so many things now. I, I'm sorry, I don't have time to pray. You know, I got I to gotta Skype somebody, Facebook somebody. Uh, what, what's the other one? Twitter somebody. I got to... If you can get the most toys, you'll be out of the loop for spiritual things. Don't got time. One brother told me there's two great days in his life. The day he finally got up the money and he bought him a boat, and the other day was the day he sold the boat. <laughs> if you know what it's like to gotta have a boat, You've got a girlfriend on the side. You've got, you got to spend a lot of time on that little thing. I wonder if it's worth it in the end. There's going to be accounting for all the things we do and all the time we do. And the Ephesians, Paul just puts it this wonderful way. And I, I'm going to interpret it. You, I'm just prophetically interpreting some things this morning. We need to redeem the time. Now that means to buy it back they got, because the world's got your time. Now, there's a couple of you, and praise God, you've probably been working for 40 years or more to get to that place where you can pretty much work as much as you want to. Most of you, the world's got your time. You're on the world's clock. There's some people here and having to call in every time a meeting's over and find out what's going on and do some extra work at night. I mean, the world's got your clock. And they've got this, you've got to do this. And then the school says you've got to do that with your children and this and that. And, you know, your clock is complete. Unless you buy back time for the Lord, it'll be all gone. Redeeming the time costs something. You're buying it back. The devil stole it. You need to buy it back. Otherwise, you'll never be prepared. You'll be asleep. And of course we know, I mean, it's sad to say, it's such a simple thing. Again, I speak as kindergarten, but many people are asleep in the, because they've been in the shadows of unconfessed sin. You just won't admit that thing is a sin, and because you won't admit it, the blood of Jesus won't be applied to it, and because the blood of Jesus won't be applied to it, you live in a kind of a spiritual shadow. And until you confess and get it right, you're wasting time, marking time in the shadow. And Jesus brings to light one of the simplest and most profound problems among Christians, and that's unforgiveness. Puts you right in the shadows. How can the Lord answer your prayer if you can't forgive your brother? So simple. It takes you right out of life. And something more subtle. Delayed obedience. Delayed obedience. Or the I'll get around to it intention that never materializes. Isn't it interesting the children of Israel decided to go in and take the promised land the day after the Lord said it was too late. When the Lord said go, they said no. Then the Lord said, okay, you can't go. Then they say, now we're going. <laughs> now there's many brothers here and you're in your midlife now and God has a calling on your life for perfection and to uh, fellowship in the bride, and you've delayed it and not been faithful. You've stalled on the calling of God. And it's put you into some kind of a slumber where you can actually sit in an assembly and not feel you have any obligation to live by the life of the Lord among God's people. And the church in the assembly is sorely needing. Brothers, awake! So you're into your second million, are you? Is that making you happy? That you're in a bondage to the world? You're having to bow down to Babylon? Is that making you happy? Now, you see, here's, this, here's the thing now. The Lord doesn't tell you to quit your job. He tells you to be His disciple. He doesn't tell you to not go to school, not pursue a vocation, forget about getting married. No, no, in the midst of all that, Seek the kingdom of God first and His righteousness and all these other things get added along. As soon as they get put up in some kind of a spot where it starts delaying obedience, we're in serious trouble.
Well, what's, what's the Lord's remedy to sleep? I mean, I speak as a fool. Somehow the voice of God has to shout, wake up. And we see it put in these simple terms, repent. If we're talking about the church being ready to express with the Spirit, come Lord Jesus, we're talking that to a church in the book of Revelation where five out of seven were told, repent. Awaken from sleep. Now let's, let, let's just see, again, let's just see so we can understand what this whole thing of sleep is all about. Because people are very busy, but they're sleepwalking. So let's understand. What does it mean to be asleep? All of you know that our primary example of the need for repentance came at that juncture in history where John the Baptist was raised up to prepare the way for the Messiah to come. Now there was a problem. Now what was the problem? Israel was completely unprepared for a Messiah. How do I know that? Because when Jesus came, most of them looked at him eyeball to eyeball and couldn't see he was Messiah. Now that means they lack spiritual preparation. Do you see what I'm saying? But John was sent, and this is God's mercy. John was sent before Jesus came, and here's what he said. The kingdom of God is upon us, and you're not ready. You're naked. You're full of sin. You're not ready for the Messiah. Repent. Come in these waters. Prepare your heart. For there is one coming right around the corner. And I'm not even worthy to untie his shoelaces. But he's coming, and you better be ready for him. He's coming, and he's going he's gonna to sift out wheat and chaff. And he was talking about Jesus. And how close was Jesus to coming around the corner? Six months at most. John came, and this is how God divinely wakes up the church. God sent a voice. They asked John, what are you, a prophet? He says, I'm a voice. Let's be even more specific. He was the voice predicted in Isaiah chapter 40. A voice crying in the wilderness. But when he spoke, it was God's voice spoken through him. And there were a, mercifully a large number of people who woke up. It was a shock to their Jewish system. These people actually woke up when they heard God's voice. After 400 years of prophetic silence. Now God spoke to individuals, but... To, the, to Israel, there was 400 years of prophetic silence, and suddenly, boom, like a thunderclap, John said, the kingdom's here. And people found themselves immediately unprepared. Now, up to that point that John spoke, I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, those people, especially those in Judea, and especially those who hung around Jerusalem, who were religious people, professional religious people, or full-time amateur religious people. People who go to this conference, and then WCC, and WCCC, and then the, the Far East Conference, and all of those people thought they were ready. That's spiritual sleep. All, all of them. Listen, they say, well, are, you, are you kidding? I gave sacrifices. I just came, and I spent $29 on a, on a blemishless lamb. We ate the way we ate, we prayed the way we're supposed to pray, went to the temple, listened, joined, worshipped, went back home, did all the things I was supposed to do, I, I screwed a thin little paper thing on my head, I did all of these kinds of things, I, I, I'm ready, I'm ready. Oh, we want the Messiah to come, we want him to throw down the Roman government, yeah, we want the Messiah to come, we're ready for him, we're ready. And their spirit was completely unready. They just thought they had to do some more religious stuff. And maybe the Messiah would come. They were praying for the Messiah to come. Just to knock off Rome. And set Israel free at last. And then here comes the Messiah. Who's ready for him? John, John and Andrew. Who are they? Little Johnny Fisher boy. And Andrew, Peter's brother. And the only thing had going for him is when they heard John the Baptist, their hearts were done in. They were crushed, went in the waters, were baptized. 
And they were hanging around John when Jesus came and Jesus said, ah, there's the Lamb of God. And old Johnny and Andrew went and followed Jesus because they saw who he was. They woke up and they followed the Messiah. And there were others who woke up as well, thank God. God, Jesus gathered some disciples. And who were those disciples? They were people who woke up. Well, now that's the days and that's another dispensation. But you see, the whole point is this. If I could put it simply, the bridegroom is saying, behold, I come quickly. That's the divine voice from heaven for his church. And we don't hear it. I suppose we're very satisfied with this world when you get right down to it. And we're also very unprepared. You know, our, our king is so great that actually, to tell you the truth, I don't know how I could work this out doctrinally. Even if the Lord Jesus wanted to come for his bride in his present state, our father would disallow it because it would be an insult to our king. Our king is so worthy. He's so glorious. So full of love, so long-suffering. He's been waiting such a long time, but he will not come to a babe. He, 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 heaven insists he come to a bride. This bride's voice has to be changed from babyhood into a single cry of an adult, mature, Christ-like vessel who can say, come. And the church isn't at that point. Actually, when some people hear the, the fact that the matter Jesus is coming soon, I hear Christians say this. Oh, Jesus, don't come, don't come. As if this is some kind of thing he wants to hear. No, no, I'm not ready. No, no, my family's not ready. No, 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 please, I, I, I'm not ready. Better you speak against yourself and say, I'm not ready. And I may not be in that wife band, but Lord Jesus, come. Oh, we have such selfish hearts. The fact of the matter is, uh, he can only come to a bride who has first love. Right? He can only hear the voice of somebody saying, come, who, who is showing in their life that he is their special treasure. And if he's not those things to us, we're not really there yet. Now, do we believe in His coming? Maybe as simple a start as that. Do you believe in His coming? Second question, do you desire His coming? Desire His coming. Now, don't give me a religious shibboleth now. Do you desire His coming? Even if it's against yourself, even if it means you don't get married, even if it means you don't get that bonus, even if it means you never do fulfill your life's dream. May you seek the kingdom of heaven in such a way that His coming will be your life's dream. Are you prepared for His coming? Church, are you prepared for His coming? I don't think there's any of us who, uh, I'm not sure how sure you are that you could say, yes, I'm prepared. So I'm going to ask you another question. This isn't a loophole, but it's a reality. Okay, if you can't say you're prepared for His coming, then I have a question for you. Can you say right now, you're preparing for His coming? I believe in the end that that moment He comes, there'll be Christians of maturity and Christians newly born. But the fact of the matter is, they'll all be preparing, growing, spiritually increasing, finding a fuller possession of Christ in their lives, allowing the Spirit and the work of the cross to build something of the care. They're in a preparation stage. Now, preparation, I'm not talking about some automatic thing that happens as you just take it in by osmosis. Are you preparing for the coming of the Lord? Then, repent. Now, this, uh, so, you know, our brother Lance talked about a word which is really uh, one of my precious words. This whole matter of awakening. 
Can I just finally mention two things about awakening? Repentance as awakening. For that's what repentance really is. It's a whole new thought process that come because you've been awakened out of your sleep. There are two things that happen at the same time when somebody is awakened out of spiritual sleep. And they happen at the same time. But they bring us immediately into a place of preparing. Now, what are those two things that happen when we repent? Of course, it's by the sovereign majesty of God that He awakens us. You understand? We can't awaken ourselves. Dana, wake up. Wake up. It's no good. <laughs> I love to watch people who, who uh, uh, the Brazilians say, you're going fishing when you're going like this. Because your head's like bobbing in the water. <laughs> and, and every time I speak, I can look around. I can find somebody. I've seen some people, that I've seen, uh, it's especially sisters punching brothers, trying to wake them up. <laughs> Usually it's all in vain. And we speak the word of God to one another, but unless the Holy Spirit speaks into your heart, you will not wake up. You'll remain in spiritual sleep. Eyes all greased up. Ears too heavy to hear. Heart that's dull as a stone. But if the Spirit speaks to you and you awake... I tell you, you won't be the same. Two things happen in an awakening. One, you immediately become aware of your real spiritual condition. I mean, it's an undoing to be awakened. It's true, you also become aware of the real spiritual condition of the surroundings. If we could use once again Isaiah... When the Lord opened up the heavens and he saw Jehovah sitting on a throne, he said, well, woe is me. That was his first response. I am undone. He said, I am a man of unclean lips. But he also could see in that same moment of clarity, and I live among a people of unclean lips. It happened all in a moment. And he was undone. Now, I, I put to you something that I can't prove right now, but I, I do believe it. Before Jesus came and stood in the midst of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, none of them had any idea they were anything other than fully prepared. That's just the way we are. We deceive ourselves in our sleepiness. So let's just look. Spend the last few moments here. Looking in Revelation chapter 3, in the church of Sardis, just to read a few verses here. Now here's the Lord Jesus, the glorious high priest, examining the lampstand in Sardis. And it says, Did the angel of the church of Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you're alive, but you are dead. Now that's Jesus talking. Then he says, Wake up! And that's Jesus talking. To a church by the end of the first century, not a church in the 21st century. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. I, Jesus, stand in the midst and say, wake up. I know that probably all of you have studied these seven churches and examined them and seen what the Lord commends and what he rebukes and all of these things. But I, I just, I, what I'm asking for is that you and I might see with eyes of the Spirit the Lord Jesus standing in the midst of your assembly. Now that's our only hope. Wherever you meet. Have you ever seen the Lord Jesus stand in the midst of your assembly? And what does he say about it? I, I don't care for the moment if you can define what if uh, the poor Laodiceans or the Ephesians, forget them. Have you ever heard Jesus speaking in the midst of your assembly saying, this I commend you for, this I rebuke, repent and do that. Now I'll guarantee you he wants to stand in the midst of every assembly. But I'll also almost assure you that we are so asleep that we think we're okay. Especially if you look around at some destitute assembly. 
You say, oh, well, we're a lot better than that. No, no, when the, when the Lord Jesus comes in your midst, it's only, only one church you got to do. It's the assembly you're in. Are you asleep? Is your assembly asleep? Well, imagine Jesus saying, wake up. What do you mean, wake up? We were just praising your name. Praise God, hallelujah. He says, wake up. What do you mean? He says, I've commanded you to do things. You got halfway to them, then you just kind of didn't finish them. You think that's pleasing to my God? Is that a testimony? You fell asleep. Strengthen the things that have remained. Because you had a reputation that you were a living church, but you're just dead to me. And he's talking about them awaking spiritually. Of course, the church of Laodicea has been mentioned so many times, we hesitate to even mention it. But can you imagine this church? I, I, once again, do I have to argue the case that Laodicea thought they were a pretty good church? Pretty good church. Outside the door, a sign. Pretty good Christian fellowship. <laughs> <clears throat> and this is such a serious matter because it applies to most of the church today in this age of Laodicea. The Lord comes in and says, I, I, I'm ready to spit you out. You're so displeasing to me. Half-heartedness. Praise with one hand up in the air. Prayer with one eye open, looking at your watch. You're so self-sufficient. You got all the money you need. You got your preachers. You got your Sunday school system. You got everything so nice. You got it all set up just the way you like it. And you're getting pretty particular about the way you like it. And if somebody says something a little different from what you like, you, you say, you're not that guy. But the Lord comes and says, you know, you're poor and wretched and blind and naked. Uh, how, how, can he come, how can he come for the church of Laodicea? And I, I'm asking you. You're poor, wretched, blind, and naked. So I'm asking you to get some eye salve to get that this grease off your eyeball. And to buy some gold instead of that junk you're carrying around thinking it's valuable. And wash your robes. Make sure they're white. No stain, no sin. Wake up. But you notice what he does say at the end there. And this is the long suffering of our Lord Jesus. In verse 19, after he speaks to Laodicea in chapter 3, he says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful that when the Spirit spoke into the church of Laodicea, oh, I don't know how big that church was, how many members it had, but I am so happy to say that there were some who heard and repented and will be able to sit in the throne of God even as Jesus overcame. There were some there. But the first thing you see when there's an awakening, and it's an awful awakening, you, you know, when we talk about the great awakenings that have happened in church history, we often think of the ingathering of souls that were saved during those times. But that was actually the after effect of the church repenting and coming back to what the Lord wanted. When, when the church in Wales repented and came back to their spiritual condition that the Lord desired for them, then people got saved as fast as they could come and hear the testimonies. If the Lord can find a church that's, that's truly awake and living and, and, and serving and doing what He wants and loving Him and waiting for Him, the Lord can do magnificent things through such a church. But the first thing is to see our true condition. But at the same moment, this is the, this is the so redemptive thing about this. At the same moment we see our spiritual condition, we see the sovereign God alive, standing over you, ready to bring you into his preparation work. Do you understand what I'm saying? You see your state, and then... You see a Lord who sovereignly already has a plan for you to make it. So, so as an example, there, there's Isaiah and he fell apart. He said, woe is me, a man of unclean lips. And then the Lord said, he said, I will send me. He saw that there was a plan. There's something I can do about it. You see, Isaiah had, this is what he had wrong. He was trusting in King Uzziah. And he was trusting in the kingdom of Judah. 
And when he saw who was the real king of Israel, it changed his whole life. He died to trying to serve the king of Judah. And he lived to serving Jehovah sitting on a throne. He said, Jehovah, what do you want me to do? Forget being a prophet for Judah. I want to be your prophet. What do you want me to do? And I, long story short, maybe it sounds funny, but God said this, preach to the stump. I says, go ahead and prophesy to people who won't listen. Talk to people who won't hear. Talk to people whose hearts are deaf. But I want you to go on and preach the truth anyway because there's a stump, a remnant that's alive and bears seed and can grow. So go on. Speak to the remnant. And we know that's what he saw. That's my way forward. And the first thing he did was have a kid and call him a remnant shall return. Sure, Jacob, he, he found the way. I've spoken to all, but they won't listen. But there's the stump that's listening. All right, stump, let's get together and pray. And so the remnant. Isaiah gave us more insight into what the remnant was like than any other prophet in the Old Testament. That was the Lord's way forward. Now the Lord comes and by His Spirit, he, sp he stood in front of all seven churches and He says, this I see and this you must repent of. And then He says, okay, uh, who can hear me? Who, who, who's hearing me? And many of the people didn't hear, obviously. But those who heard, heard and heeded and repented, found themselves in, in a life gathered with some other ones who loved the Lord so much. And they overcame all of the currents that were working against them. They overcame, and they added to their prayer, Oh, Messiah, come, come. Now, when the Lord reveals the devastation around you, He also reveals that He's got a plan forward. You know, Daniel's prayer in chapter 9 is one of the great confessionary prayers where he prayed on behalf of all Israel in captivity. But why did Daniel pray that prayer? What gave him the forward impulse of the Spirit to pray that particular prayer about them going back to Jerusalem? It's because someone gave him a scroll of Jeremiah and he realized that it was only 70 years before God had a plan for prosperity and for hope and a destiny for you. And Daniel started praying because he saw that God would move them back to Jerusalem to build the house of God. You see, there's a plan forward. If you notice in all of the seven churches and the five where he commands them to repent, he always adds... And then do this. So to Ephesus, he says, Now remember from where you have fallen, and repent and do the deeds you did at first. And that doesn't change in what deeds were done as much as it was the fullness of Christ expressed as they did the deeds out of first love. And so for each of the churches called on to repent, there was a way forward. Do this. Keep this. Wonderful Lord. Uh, is it worth the awakening? Is it worth the awakening to discover the living God in our midst? Is it worth it to you? We have a particular problem. I end with this, and I see I'm already crazy over time. All right. Let me just end with this. We have a special problem. What do you do with people who were once awakened? and now have cataracts again. This is the greatest complicated thing in the Bible. It's one thing to be a Christian, you were in the church, and you're awakened to see that we were asleep and we weren't prepared. It's another thing to have been awakened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and now to find cataracts settling back in. What do you do? Well, uh, the two most difficult books that I know to expound in the Bible are Malachi and Hebrews. Both of them speaking to people who once were enlightened and now are falling back asleep. What do you do with Malachi? Who, who, who's, who is Malachi writing to? He's writing to the remnant who sacrificed all, came back from Babylon, built the city of God, built the temple, and now it's a hundred years later, the grandkids of the remnant that was faithful. And the Lord comes to them and says, uh, I have loved you. They say, how have you loved me? 
God says, you've robbed me. How have we robbed you? God says, I'm weary with your complaints. How have we wearied you? This is the attitude of modern Christians. The Lord says, I want you to come follow me. Prepare yourselves for my coming. We say, well, what have I got to do? What haven't I done already? Haven't I done enough? You're offering blemished sacrifices. What do you mean by the sacrifices? Boy, you, you read the book of Malachi. You see the churlish, rebellious state of God's children. Except at the end where you see some people who feared the Lord and they, they listen, they're talking to one another, they're praying. And the Bible says from heaven, God looks down and sees that remnant, writes their name in the book. And the rest of them, what do you do with people who grow cataracts again? And when you remind them to repent, they get churlish. And say, what have I, what more do I need to, haven't I done enough? Why, I serve you for 40 years, isn't it time for me to retire, just sit on back? It's a good argument. But the Lord will win that argument if you'll fall before him. I know these are heavy words. I, I'm sorry to be one who brings in such a strong word, but if we don't hear the Spirit calling us to repent, there's no hope. Not in this generation. If we don't hear the Lord telling us, you're doing something wrong and you're on the wrong track and I want to talk to you about it, but you won't even listen to me. You don't even realize you need repentance. Repentance is an awakening. If we see the real condition, then you don't go around blaming other people because the first thing you saw was your spiritual condition and the fact that you exist in a whole congregation who've learned your habits and are just as bad. Oh, leaders, if you don't see, your people will never see. If we're too busy trying to uh, uh, perpetuate our own situation, then may the Lord have mercy on us. Now, he's looking for a bride who can join in in one voice with the Spirit and say, Oh, Jesus, come. But the bride has got to wake up. Just as those virgins had to wake up at the coming of the bridegroom, it's time to wake up. Be prepared. And who knows, but just the awaking and the change of attitude and the repentant heart of seeing your unworthiness and seeing your unreadiness and repenting of that which He shows in the light and asking the Lord to be in the midst and asking the Lord, maybe just that attitude changes all that is necessary for the Lord to say, now I'm ready and I'll come. I'm not sure how many more works and things need to be done or how many more people need to be saved. I don't know these great mysteries. But I know in the twinkling of an eye, the Lord can come. If our attitudes can just be broken in repentance. And we cry out to the Lord. And we see Him in the midst, moving, doing something. Already doing something in your life. Believe me, if you've been awakened, and you've seen your condition, and you've seen the Lord, He's already doing something in your life. You're under repair already. You're preparing. Now, I hope that everybody here is already awakened, truly has a heart of repentance, but I share these things unless there's someone who's been asleep. And it's time to wake up. Salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Don't dawdle around. Don't get so many trinkets or be involved in the world, or in darkness, or flesh, or any of those kinds of things that would hinder you in any way from being prepared for what's about to happen. May the Lord help us in these days. Lord, do have mercy on us. Lord, and I don't speak as one who's self-righteous, but as one who needs a waking. Lord, we don't want to be uh, just in our uh, sleepy state. Oh, Lord, open our eyes by the Holy Spirit. And cause us to be those who are first in line. Woe is me. Unless the Lord does a work among us, we will not be ready. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we need to leave...
soon. I just wanted to, uh, I just had one little thought. Just give us a few minutes to respond. And I